Amen. Thanks, Ken. Hey, thanks for stepping in, Ken. Y'all pray for Tim. He is uh, taking some time off for a little while, so just pray for him and his family. And um, thank Kim, Ken, for stepping up to the plate. And, yep. Um, I forgot the clicker, so somebody's gonna have to bring me the clicker. Sam, come on up, Sam. You're like a you're like a weekly addition to the thing. Oh, did you find it? If you guys didn't know, this is Sam. Hi, Sam. Sam's in charge of media back there. Good job, Sam. Good work. Yeah. Our tech team does a fabulous job back there. I mean, other than the fact that he's wearing a Lakers shirt, but I mean, whatever. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Thank you for being here. We're going to continue on today. We got this week, and then we got one more week where we'll be wrapping everything up, and we'll be talking about the fear that we should have. Um, but today, we're going to expand our idea by taking on another example of a exhibition of courage in the face of certain fear. Uh, and by to do that, we're going to be in 1 Samuel today, chapter number 17. So if you have your Bible there with you, you can open that up. Um, if you have a hard time reading these slides, because a lot of these slides are going to be from the back, you're not going to be able to read them. These slides are all on our Facebook page. If you'd like to go there, you can click on it and enlarge the image and watch it on whatever device that you might have. Uh, and then also, uh, if you can't see it from the back, then I would suggest that you get her earlier and sit up closer to the front. You guys should see what I'm looking at, right? So you wonder why that uh, I have to turn around to read what's going on. It's because look at the tiny little monitor they give me in the back. That's what I get to look at. And, yeah, it's like, I can't read that, like this next slide. No, nah, forget that. Well, no, I could read that from here. Yeah, so I'm being unfair. So last week we talked about this idea of Peter overcoming fear to trust in the Lord and do the impossible. Um, and that was to walk on water. What an amazing event that was. You know, I mean, here he was in faced with the circumstance where fear had been introduced and there was a need for courage. He believed in Jesus Christ. He trusted Jesus Christ. Um, in that particular instance, there was no waiting to, to be made. We're going to talk about that a little bit here today. Um, but in that instance, when he had the belief, he had the trust, he stepped out and it, with instilled courage and peace in the face of fear, stepped into the impossible and did the impossible. Even though he doubted and began to sink, it still doesn't, uh, it doesn't diminish the effectiveness and the power and the amazingness of what he accomplished. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, he doubted and he began to sink, um, but how many of you guys have ever walked on water, Right. Um, so what he did was amazing and it should be thought of that way. You know, I mean, this is amazing faith in the face of tremendous courage uh, in spite of what was going on around him. So today we'll be in expanding on that idea by a fair margin. Um, it's going to be, it's going to explode open for us today because there is a, a lot more to this whole how do we have courage in the face of fear than just these things? And what you're going to find out today is, is that what we've been talking about and this concept right here is just like that much of the entire scope of what it looks like to have courage in the face of fear um, and what that looks like. And so let's begin today in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse number 1. Now the Philistines had gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokah, which belonged, belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokah and Ezekiah in that word. What is it? Ephesdamum? Ephestimum? I would say it's Ephestimum, but that's because I want to say it's Greek, but it's not. It's Hebrew, so it's probably something else. 
Um, and Saul and, his men, and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and, the, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Now, there's a lot of debate as to what six cubits in a span actually meant to the Hebrews. Some of the older documents, historical documents like Josephus would put them at about eight feet. Um, but uh, six, traditionally, six cubits would have made him right around 11 feet tall. So eight to 11 feet tall, what most people do is they take the average between, and so you come up with about nine and a half feet. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's a paltry nine and a half feet. That's what we end up with as an average so this was a giant of a man, uh, and you know we we look at this as a very um, as a very special circumstance because it's not like we don't see a lot of giants today. Actually, historically, there were a lot of giants. You should look into that. Um, interestingly enough, uh, in most cultures all throughout history, there have been men of great renown that were of great stature. Um, some of them eight to eleven feet tall. Uh, this was not something, I mean, this was uncommon, um, but it's not something that was unheard of. Uh, and so here's this guy, he's 8 to 11 feet tall, verse number 5 says, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, it was brass because we haven't reached the bronze age yet, upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, uh, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, so his armored coat was about 156 pounds. Um, which is heavy. Um, I don't know if you guys have had any experience like wearing plate, ar plate carriers or, or armor or anything like that. Um, plate carriers end up being like right around the 30 pound range um, if you have front and back. And so, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're carrying them a lot, you, you do kind of get used to them after a while, but if you're, if you're working out with them a lot, they're, they're heavy. Well, imagine, you know, wearing five of those, right? Um, this was no joke, 156 pounds. This, this co you know, this whole section is just kind of fr to frame out, you know, what it was that David was going to be looking at. That's all this is there for. It's just to kind of provide some background. And he had a, uh, greaves of brass upon his legs, um, and he started the timer. Um, and a helmet of brass upon his head. Uh, coat of mail, blah, blah, blah. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels. So his entire spear probably weighed about 37 pounds. Um, the head itself was about 18 pounds. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, I mean, if you had a, you know, a weaver's beam, which would have been, you know, like 10 feet long, um, with a with a with an 18 pound weight at the end of it, hold it in the middle and hold it outright like you're going to fight with it, and you can you can kind of start to get an image of just how strong and powerful this guy was. Amazing. Um, and the uh, spearhead was made out of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. All of his gear probably was about 270 ish pounds total. Um, and so he was lugging this around as a, as a champion of the Philistines coming out. And, and so verse 8 tells us, He stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am, I, am not I a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Which this is a really bizarre kind of idea of how warfare worked in those days. You know, you have an army allied on one side and you have an army on the other side, and you got this guy coming out into the middle of the field, and he's challenging your champion, saying, send out your champion. You know, I mean, I guess it was a day of honor in those days. I mean, myself, I would probably have lined up about 50 archers and just, like, have at them. Um, but that's not what they were doing. You know, I mean, I guess there was, like, some kind of code of honor that kept them from from going after this guy. Whatever the case was, I mean, he's out there. He's, he's yelling at him. He's like, hey, choose you a man and let him come down to me and fight me. He, if he is able to fight me, to kill me, then we will be your servants. 
Then if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that, will, that, may, that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and, here we go, greatly, what, afraid. It's kind of like what happened with the disciples. You know, they got into the boat, they were the boat, the waves were, and the wind was, you know, and all that, and, and they were afraid. They were filled with fear. It's not like fear had presented itself and then they are overcoming it. No, they have succumbed to fear. Uh, and their entire army has succumbed to fear. These people, there's nobody in the entire army that's going to go down and actually confront this guy. They were all greatly afraid. Now, 12 through 28 kind of introduces David and talks about who he is and, and, and talks about his family a little bit, the son of Jesse. You guys have all heard this story before if you've been in church for more than, than five years or if you've ever gone to junior church or Sunday school, you all know this story. You know, I mean, David was a shepherd boy. He watched after his father's sheep. Um, he uh, was a, 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 a young man at this time. Um, though he wasn't to be trifled with, we're going to see here in just a minute. But what has happened is, is that his father Jesse has given him some stuff to take to his brothers on the front. They're just going to take them some food, going to take them some stuff to, to help them to get through this time period that they're on the, the front lines of this battle because that's where his sons are at. And so David has been charged with taking the cart of food um, to his brothers to, to relieve them. Um, and then he's to come back and, and, and take care of all that stuff. And so he's gone and he is talking with his brothers. And so he has, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. So this is the first time that David has heard him come out and defy the armies of the Lord um, to send out a champion to fight for the cause of Israel. Um, and, you know, I, I was kind of rough on him at first about this whole kind of thing, but if you think about it, this would have been a much preferred way of dealing with this conflict, because if you could have had a champion go out and, and confront each other, and there was a mutual agreement that the army would back down if the champion lost, and if that was kept, um, then imagine the lives that would have been saved in that conflict. Um, instead of wiping out needlessly an entire army of people, you could have gained an army. Um, and so this is an attractive offer. This is probably why they've been waiting so long to try and do something about this, other than the fear aspect and not having a champion. Saul's probably kind of waiting for somebody to come along. It's like, man, if somebody would just come along, this would be an advantageous way to end this conflict without us having to sacrifice a lot of people. Um, and so David now has heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw, or when they, they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Now, I don't know if that means that they were standing on the hilltop and he came out in the valley and he said some stuff and then they all ran, like even though they were way far away from him. I don't really know exactly what that means, but it doesn't really say a whole lot for the men of Israel at that time. It says, and the men of Israel said, have ye seen this man that has come? This is like this rumor mill that's going on, and everybody's talking about it. Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So this offer has already been out for some time. It's been out long enough that the men are like talking about it amongst themselves. It's not like it, Saul has just come up with this statement. Though a lot of times people get this misconception that David comes along, and then when David comes along, Saul issues this statement, and then David responds to the statement, which really doesn't, it doesn't give David the credit that he's due when, it, when he's responding to some kind of a, an award. That's not the reason that David responds to this. We're going to see in a minute, right? So he, this has already been offered. The men have already been talking about it. There's this great thing that's going to happen if someone will step up. But even though they'll have great riches, even though they'll have the king's daughter, which means they will instantly become part of royalty, and even though their house will be free, not a single man has stepped up to face the giant, obviously. Um, and for good reason, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, it, it, 
it's easy for us to say that, you know, I would have done that, but, you know, I don't know, man, when you're facing the nine-foot guy with 270 pounds of gear um, and you're, you're, you're looking at him towering over you, you know, I mean, it's like things begin to alter in our minds about how we anticipate things are going to go. Um, you know, it's funny, like, when we start thinking about the way we think things are going to go, we have in our mind, you know, the, this is the way that it's, you know, it's like, if you've ever been in a position where you're going to quit a job, you know, you get this, you know, you know that you're going to quit this job because it's terrible and you got something lined up and you're just like really aggravated and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to tell the boss this and this and this and this and this and this and you have all these things in your head that you're going to say and then it comes to the moment where you're going to actually do it and you're standing there just like, well, I, you know, I, I'm going to have to quit and, it, and, and it, you know, and it's like everything changes when the scenario comes into, into effect. And then, like, later on, you, you know, you're thinking to yourself, man, why didn't I say this? And, and why didn't I, you know, all these things that, that, these clever quips that you could, it just never happens that way. We're going to talk about that, too, why that happens. Um, so, and David spake to the men that stood by him. So David's just standing with a group of men, and he says to these guys, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the approach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. He's probably the only guy talking like that right now. He's like, who is this guy? He's like, oh, you mean that nine-foot guy over there? That guy? No, David's like, who is this guy? This uncircumcised Philistine that would defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him after the manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why camest thou down hither? All right, so he's going to throw some accusations at David here, and a lot of people have taken these accusations to kind of say that David was prideful and that there was naughtiness in his heart um, and that he's come down to see the battle and that he should be in the sheep of this wilderness. Baron his brother has been one of the ones that's been cowering in fear for the last so many weeks as the Philistines been coming out. So perhaps his brother wasn't as mad at David as he was at himself. Um, you know, fear has a way of doing that. It has a way of instilling us with shame and with guilt. Um, and a lot of times when you have shame and guilt, you end up lashing out at other people. It's probably what happened here. I think he lashed out at David. And this is what David said. And of course, this is the phrase that a million sermons have been written on right here. What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? You know, this is a, the million dollar question. Um, it's relevant today. It'll be relevant tomorrow. It's relevant in the past. I'm sure many, many sermons will be preached about the future. I have preached sermons on it. I imagine I will preach sermons on it again before I die. Um, this is not what we're talking about today, but it is an important question that we need to be asking ourselves as well. Is there not a cause? Because one of the things that helps us to be able to overcome fear and to have courage in the face of fear is understanding that we're part of something that is bigger than ourselves. It's one of the reasons why a gathering of people together to worship in spirit and in truth is really important because it helps us and inspires us and it shows us that we are, some, we are part of something larger than ourselves. It's a visible, physical representation of the team. This is the team, guys, right? This is, this is who we are. And we do these things together. Is there not a cause? It's one of the things that we need to be asking ourselves. Is there not a cause? Yes, there is a cause. There are countless numbers of people dying and going to hell on a daily basis. There are people that are suffering in sin and anguish and guilt and shame. Yes, these people can be set free by the truth that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And that they can accept his free gift of salvation and be saved themselves. This is the cause. And everything else that happens ancillary to that happens because the cause is being fought for. The cause of Jesus Christ. Is there not a cause? So now the crowd factors in a little bit. 1 Samuel 17, 30 through 32. And he turned from him toward another and spake unto the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner, 
So David's starting to get a little bit of a flash mob going here is what he's doing. He didn't have social media in those days. So basically he had to rely on word of mouth. And so what he's doing is he's talking to different people. He's like, guys, is there not a cause? There's something to fight for. Who is this guy? Why are we afraid of him? Who's going to go out and face him? Is there not somebody? Is there not something worth fighting for here? Are we not the armies of the living God? Is that not who we are? Here's this boy from the shepherd's field coming to tell all these mighty warriors, which were probably mostly conscripted, but in any case, all these warriors that are out there ready to go down and fight the Philistines, right? All of them cowering in fear from this great champion. David's like, why are we standing here cowering? Who is there not a cause? 31, and when, da- when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. So Saul is now hearing what's being talked about out there. The weight of the crowd's approval begins to weigh in. Saul has little choice really at this point. You know, it's like you read through the story and you see where David comes into the tent and Saul's questioning him. And, and we're going to read that in here in just a second about him just not being a regular boy. He's not a warrior, right? You know, who are you? And, 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 and Saul's got these questions for him. And, and there's like this, there's this lingering thought that kind of occurs where it's like, why would Saul allow this young boy to walk out onto the battlefield with just a sling? Why would he even allow that with so much at stake, right? Because if David loses, Israel is slave to the Philistines. So Saul is putting all his faith in this shepherd boy that's carrying a sling. And happens later is is that Saul even offers his armor. He says, take my armor, take my sword. David's like, no, I, I, I don't know how to use those. I haven't proven them. But Saul lets him go anyways. It's like, why? Well, Saul really didn't have much of a choice. He's already made this offer. He's like, if any man steps forward to do this thing, this is what I'm going to offer. Well, here's the man that has stepped forward. Now you have to live up to your word. And if you don't live up to your word, then what are you going to do? You're going to incite the anger of the mob. And so Saul's in a pickle here, man. Don't get too hard on him because... Given the opportunity to be in the circumstances that he is in, much of you might make the same choice. It's not an easy situation for Saul. Saul has to decide. You know, it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do? And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Whether it's this courage or whether it's pride. I think it was courage. And I'll tell you why I think it was courage. 1 Samuel 17, 33 through 37, and Saul said to David, and this is Saul, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. It's a really important phrase. It doesn't seem important. It seems really innocuous, but that is a really important phrase. And there came a lion and a bear and a and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and I smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Okay, let that sink in for just a second, okay, guys? I know that that's to Scripture, and we've read it a thousand times. And we get this idea of David, you know, hurling sling bolts at this, you know, lion or this bear, right? And that's not what happened, guys, all right? So what happened was, is what had happened was, is this lion had came in and he had taken a sheep. And so David was like, not today. And so David goes after him and he grabs the lion by his beard and smote him. Hebrew for beat him to death with his bare hands. Well, you can imagine Saul at this point, he's like, oh, okay. So David goes on and he says, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised, he keeps bringing this up because he wants to make sure he understands that this 
Philistine is not of God, that he is actually opposed to God. This is not a physical battle. This is a spiritual battle. This is a battle being fought in a physical world on a spiritual plane. Uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God, Jehovah, God Almighty. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, hey, go. And the Lord be with thee. And this is where it gets really cool. Right? We're not going to get into any of the battle, the conflict, because we've all heard that before. We're not going to get into the sling and not going to get into the, to the, to the stones. And we're not going to get into the sword that he cut off Goliath's head with and killed him with and that he would eventually claim back. We talked about that in Psalms. We're not going to talk about all that because what's relevant to what we're talking about is what happened before. Because, see, David is faced with this extreme fearful circumstance. Fear as no one has ever seen before, as evidenced by the fact that no man was willing to stand before the giant. But David, when he saw the giant, he didn't even hesitate. There was no hesitation in the face of David as he looked at the Philistine and he said, who's that guy? And why is he defying the armies of the Lord? And why have we not done anything about it? David didn't hesitate. He didn't have to stop and pray. He didn't have to wait on the Lord. He didn't have to consider whether it was God's will or not. He didn't have to kind of sit in a tent and say, well, let me see if I get you know, a feeling that this is what God wants me to do. No, he saw that there was something that opposed God, and he went after it without hesitation. How do you get to that point? Because so far we've kind of talked about fear, and we talked about having courage in the face of fear, and some of the things that we've talked about in order to be able to overcome fear have been believe and trust and praise. You know, and sometimes we have to wait on the Lord to, to understand what, what we're supposed to do in the face of fear. You know, these are all things that, that, that may occur or that should occur when we are confronted with something that rises up, this giant that rises up before us, right? But I'm going put to put forward to you here today that the preparation for courage begins in the field with your father's sheep. You see, the first part of this is that he was obedient. He was obedient to his father in that he was tending the fields. I'm sure that this young man would have rather have been at the battlefield, judging by the way that David was a warrior with a warrior's heart. I'm sure that he would much rather have been there, but we do know that he was with his father, and he was obeying his father and keeping his father's sheep. And there was something that occurred there because when he was keeping his father's sheep, this put him in a position to be tested. I can't imagine that David has fought too many lions in his day. In fact, he doesn't say that I fought a lot of lions. He says, I fought a lion and I fought a bear and I fought a lion and I fought a bear because they came and they took one of my father's sheep. And when they took one of my father's sheep, I had to obey my father and protect the sheep. And so I went after the lion. He didn't ask you know, what's going to happen to me if I go after the lion? What's going to me, happen to me if I go after the bear? No, nope. something happened that put him in a position to where he needed to react to the obedience of his father. And so he went after the lion like he should be. And what happens with us a lot of times is, is that we have tribulations that take place in our lives. And those tribulations that happen in our lives, those diverse temptations, those things that happen to us over time, like it's talked about in James chapter, one, chapter number one, those temptations, those trials, they work patience, and patience works wisdom. Over time, as we're obedient to God, what happens is, is we are confronted by things over and over again. 
And given the opportunity to do that, what we find is, is that we gain previous experience with God. And as we gain a previous experience with God, we find that our faith in God grows more and more. You say, well, I should have unlimited faith when I'm saved. Well, do you feel like you have unlimited faith? Because there's plenty of times where I don't feel like I have unlimited faith. In fact, there's plenty of times where I doubt and, and I fear and I distrust and I have to pray through that and I have to work through that. That's a trying. That's, a, that's something that's happening as I'm being obedient in God's work, as I'm being obedient in the field, as I'm keeping the sheep, so to speak. And as you're keeping the sheep and as you're doing the things that God has given you to do, the little things... What happens is is that he sends big things along to test you and to prepare you and to not only prepare you, but to see you overcome them, to see you endure them so that you can be better off at the end than you were at the beginning and stronger at the end than you were at the beginning. And so you find out that you learn a little bit more about God, you learn a little bit more about trust, and you learn a little bit more about faith, and so you continue to grow. And perhaps... You are in this position in life where you are trying to be obedient to the word of God. You're trying to be obedient to God, and you have all these trials coming along, right? And you're having to figure out what that means, facing these trials. You know, sometimes trials happen in our lives that we're not necessarily afraid of. It's just something we have to deal with. It's just things that we have to do. You know, sometimes we lose people. We have to mourn. It's not that we're afraid of mourning. It's just something that happens. A lot of times we get laid off from work. It's not like we're living in fear of getting laid off from work. It's just something that happens. It's just trial. And how we work through those trials kind of lifts us up and shows us exactly how we can depend and trust on God. That's our lion and our bear. As we're preparing for the event that's going to change our lives. That moment when fear rises up and, and we're faced with the giant and we have a choice to make whether we're going to be courageous or whether we're going to be cowardice. So when the giant came... The challenge that would define his life forever. David did not hesitate because he already knew the God that he served. It leads us to an interesting word. Preparation. Practice. Training. David didn't wait till game day to get prepared. And this is the root of the problem when it comes to courage and believers. A lot of times when we're faced with the opportunity to be courageous or to live in cowardice and live in fear... A lot of times the reason that that happens is is because we're not really familiar with the God that we serve. We haven't tried him. We haven't really been tested because we haven't really put ourselves out there in obedience to God. In fact, there's probably a good chance that a great majority of you in here are living in direct disobedience to God. In that you probably never read your Bible, maybe once or twice a week, if you could be inconvenienced enough to do that. You might pray at dinner, or you might pray in the morning, or you might pray once or twice a week. Depending on what's going on, you know, I mean, prayer might be able to get snuck in there a little bit as something that might be, you know, trivially important. We don't really try to do anything to really serve the Lord. I mean, we live our lives and pretend that living our lives normally, as long as we do like good things, 
is serving the Lord, but we don't read our Bible, we don't pray, so we don't really know what serving the Lord in our real lives looks like. And so when the giant arises and the fear begins to overwhelm, why is it any surprise that we live in fear? Because we have never given God the opportunity to be victorious in our lives. And if God has been victorious in our lives by chance then it's just purely the grace of God working in our lives as disobedient believers, which really just is an illustration of the great love and mercy of God. David had to learn how to keep the sheep. It's not like his dad dad threw him out there and said, okay, keep the sheep. No, there's things that you have to know. It's not like he just grabbed the lion by the beard and beat him to death with his bare hands because he didn't work out. No, David had something that, that, that most believers lack, and it's discipline. David was disciplined in obeying his father. He was disciplined in doing what it was that needed to be done to obey his father, as evidenced by the fact that he went after the lion and the bear in order to take care of the sheep that he had been given charge of. That is the, that's, the, that's the measure of his obedience to his father. I mean, most people would have said, well, I know my dad's told me to take care of the sheep, but I ain't going after that lion. He's just going to have to go without the sheep. Nope, that's not David. David's obedience to his father and his demand to take care of those sheep was more important than anything that David had on his plate as far as things that he wanted. So David went after the lion, he went after the bear, and he slew him, and he took care of business, and he brought the sheep back, and he did that because he was obedient to his father because he knew that he was preparing for something else, perhaps. There's an old saying, you will never rise to the level of your expectations. You will always fall to the level of your training it's funny man it's like things of great tribulation come along and believers that don't read their bible and they don't pray and they don't work to do anything to try and serve god in their regular time they they live their lives as mediocre nominal christians that that have no dedication no discipline no desire to serve god on a daily basis expect That when they come across the giant dragon of failure and fear in their life, that somehow God's supposed to fill them with this courage to take on this giant. And what happens is, is you cower in the face of the giant because guess what? You've done no preparation to be prepared to take on the giant that you're about to experience in the first place. You've fallen to the level of your training. Instead of rising to the level of your expectations. It's just the way it is, guys. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. If you're talking about a trade, if you're talking about warfare, if you're talking about law enforcement, you're talking about medical services, you will always fall to the level of your training when you are faced with fear. So it begs the question, what is the level of your training? What is the level of your discipleship? Now I'll give you this. The church has failed in discipleship in general. We've shifted a lot to these small groups, and small groups are great. And they do have a place. I think that small groups are wonderful. But counting on small groups to be the discipleship tool of your church, it's not going to happen. You say, well, that's not true. I know that you can disciple people through small groups. and I know that you can disciple people through all kinds of means, right? Yeah, that's true. And if that were true, and if that's how it worked, then, man, we'd be doing really good right now, wouldn't we? Because I know that in this community, in this general area, there's probably 10,000 people involved in a small group right now. 
Well, that being said, man, we should be doing really great, shouldn't we? I mean, everybody should be saved. The problem is that that's not what's happening, is it? People are falling to the level of their expectations or the level of their training. They're rising to the level of their expectations because a lot of times what we do is we get to involved in groups and then we have it becomes like a like a, a social kind of thing where we just kind of encourage one another. And encouragement's great. There is a place for encouragement. I think that's one of the places where 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 small groups really shine is their ability to be able to encourage one another and lift each other up and say, guys, keep going, keep doing it. You know, it's like as a squad, you're moving forward through the world, you know. I mean, I think these are good things, but it's the church's responsibility to disciple people. It's your responsibility as an individual to be to be mentoring somebody and be discipling somebody. The idea of multiplication is not new. It's like, go ye therefore, teach and preach and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's like all of us are supposed to be making disciples. And when we say make disciples, we say make followers of Christ. And when I say make followers of Christ, I mean people that are fanatical about the cause of Christ. You find anybody that is a follower of a sports team, and they will be able to tell you every player that is on the team, their stats, how well they do, the possibilities of them being traded, the contracts that they may have. There's all kinds of information. They'll be following them on their Facebook page. They'll be learning all different things. Or if you're under the age of 30, Instagram. Apparently, Facebook is for old people. I didn't know that. I've been informed of that by my children. I don't know that that's true. Anybody under here, under 30, not use Facebook? Two people. You guys don't even know what you're talking about. It's ridiculous. It's like, when are believers going to be fanatical about Christ? When is it going to be that, that we in our, in our clubs and we that w- when we get together, what we end up talking about is we end up talking about Christ. We end up talking about theology. We end up talking about the Bible because we can't help it because it's what we love. When are we going to be fanatical about that? When are we going to be obedient to God and read our Bible every single day? You know, I know it's a pain sometimes. And I know it's easy for me to say because my job is to read the Bible every day. But, but I'm telling you guys, it doesn't have to be a big deal, and it is absolutely essential. Yep, that's it, guys. It's all over. The end of the end of everything. <laughs> Obedience, prayer, and communication. This is where it starts. You're going to see this little black box down there. That's what we've talked about so far. That's why I said we're going to expand on this a lot. Because what we talked about so far just puts us right in there. And here is where, where an already prepared heart believes and trusts and perhaps waits while praising. Right? It all starts with obedience, prayer, and communication. If you're going to be courageous in the face of fear spiritual, spiritually, emotionally, physically, it's going to take you being obedient to God in prayer and in communication with Him. That means reading His Word every day. That means studying to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Daily, continually praying, Pray without ceasing, for this is the will of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You could go on and on and on with verses of Scripture that tell you to pray and to read without fail. And when you do that, when you become obedient to God and you do those things, what you find is is that there's a testing that takes place, the trying of your faith 
faith works patience, and patience works wisdom, and those things build up in your life. And as you're building and as you're preparing, the time of fear and need for courage comes along. And yeah, maybe there is a moment where you're going to have to wait, and you're going to have to praise, and you're going to have to pray to really build up to that. But guys, I'm telling you that if you are obedient in prayer and Bible study, and you are obedient to the Word of God and serving Him in your daily life, you will be tested, and you will be built, and you will be prepared. So when the time of fear comes along, you're not going to have to think twice about what needs to be done. You're just going to jump in and take care of it because is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? David knew that there was a cause. And the result of this is a story that is so amazing that it tends itself more to like the pages of Tolkien than some religious text. But this is what God did because one boy was obedient and served his father without fail. And then the serving of his father without fail was tested with the bear and the lion. And when he was tested by the bear and the lion, when he came in the, in the presence of Goliath, he looked at him and the only, only thing that he thought was, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who does he think he is? Defying the armies of the living God. You can imagine that in David's mind, he was probably thinking, why are you guys still standing here? Why has not someone gone down and defeated that giant? Well, perhaps they weren't prepared. Anytime I get to a point in my life where I begin to think that it's not worth all the effort, it's not worth all the reading, it's not worth all the praying, it's not worth all the Bible study, I remember this story. I think about this story, and I think about the preparation that David made, and how when he came to the battlefield, he didn't even think twice about it. In fact, he didn't even have to think about what he was going to do. He just walked down there in his, in his shepherd's clothes and took out his sling. I mean, think about it. Maybe he didn't even need to use the sling. Maybe David would have just jumped over there and beat Goliath to death with his bare fists. Why he chose to use the sling, who knows? Maybe David was just being smart. Who knows what was going on in the mind of David? The bottom line is, is that David was there regardless of what David did. David was there because he trusted in an almighty, sovereign God in the face of great fear. And he did it because he rose to the level of his training. Will you rise to the level of your training? And if you rose to the level of your training, would that be much to speak of? And if you ended up falling to the level of your training, what's that going to look like? Because guys, I'll tell you what, you'll never rise to the level of your expectations. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it does for us, for the wisdom that we can gain for it. Father, as I stand here on this stage today, I just have to wonder if there are those out there in the congregation that really could use this moment to just get on their knees before you and say, God, I am sorry that I have not been obedient to you, but I dedicate my life to you. Perhaps there's some in here today that are saved by your grace and they've enjoyed the freedom of your salvation, but they have 
they have failed and the expectation of obedience afterwards. And Father, I'm just praying, Father, if there are those that are in here today that, are, that are, have fallen behind because they do not read, and they've fallen behind because they do not pray, then Father, instead of them walking out of here today discouraged and distraught and, 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 and wondering what in the world the future holds, Father, I pray that you would give them the courage at this moment as they are being tested to come before you and to get on their knees before you and say, God, I am sorry that I have failed you, Father. I dedicate my life to you, and I will read your word, and I will pray, and I will be obedient to you, and I will serve you. Father, I pray that you would help us today. In your son's precious name we pray, amen. If you'd stand. The altar is open, and I would ask you today, if you're in here today and you need to dedicate your life to the Lord, you need to be at that point where you need to get on your knees before God. You need to say, God, I want to live for you. I dedicate my life to you. This is the opportunity. Today is the day. Don't hesitate. Don't continue to live your life in mediocrity. Don't continue to live your life unprepared. Prepare today. If you're worried about persecution, you're worried about losing your freedoms, guys, I'm telling you right now, there's no amount of radios, there's no amount of food, there's no amount of ammunition that can prepare you for what you will face spiritually. The most important thing that you can get prepared with today, right now, is your relationship with an almighty God and the obedience that you have toward him. Don't walk away today the same you were when you walked in. Be different. Be different as we sing.